Good morning. I'm Melinda Salento, the Chief Executive of CEDA, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia. It's my great pleasure to welcome you back uh, to the final day of our 42nd State of the Nation Conference. Uh, can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which I'm joining you from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and pay my respects uh, to Elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the tremendous role that they play in sharing tradition, culture and their history with us in the spirit of reconciliation. A warm welcome to all of us who are joining us, uh, uh, sorry, all of you who are joining us today online. Uh, yesterday, of course, we were face to face uh, in Canberra with viewers online as well. Uh, a great audience uh, today, over 600 registered participants. So it's really great that you can join us and thank you for your support uh, and interest in CEDA's work uh, and this uh, State of the Nation forum. Um, for those on the ground yesterday, it was perhaps a slightly more chaotic State of the Nation uh, than we are used to. Uh, obviously, with ongoing developments uh, in New South Wales impacting people who were able to be with us. Uh, for those in Parliament House as well, uh, there were some interesting ongoings which led to some late shuffles of participants uh, in the event, uh, which all made for some um, added excitement, if I can put it that way. But it was a fantastic day, some great conversations, and once again, really nice to be in the room with people and getting that sort of person-to-person -person energy, which we've all been missing over the last uh, 18 months. Uh, there was a lot of great discussion. I'm not going to traverse through the many highlights for me. Uh, I will say that at the end of the day, we finished off with um, the energetic uh, and engaging Mariana Mazzucato, um, who I think really got people talking and drawing some ideas together from the day. Uh, in talking to people after her presentation, some of the comments that really stood out were her observations about the outsourcing activities of some uh, governments and public service, services around the world. Uh, her throwaway line, if I can put it that way, was uh, don't outsource your brain uh, or you do become stupid, uh, which was uh, pretty succinct uh, as she normally is. Um, but she did speak at length about some really interesting ideas around conditionality uh, and conditionality for government support. So if government is going to support investment and innovation and provide support for business, what might they expect in return? And she spoke to issues around um, excess profits and how government should think about those uh, and gave a really interesting example of um, AT&T, the telecommunications uh, business in the US, which had a monopoly in the early 1900s, and how the government actually made them um, think about how they could use their profits to reinvest in innovation which was, of course, the foundation for Bell Labs, which then went on to be a really significant contributor of new ideas, um, innovation, uh, in, and, and innovation in the US. So a really great way to finish the day. If you haven't had a chance to uh, listen to that or if you weren't participating yesterday, jump online and have a look at her presentation as well as all of the others from yesterday. Uh, a really big thanks to our conference sponsors, uh, Commonwealth Bank and KPMG, You've been tremendous supporters of ours for a long time and uh, obviously we wouldn't be able to do this and live stream to such a wide audience uh, without your support. Um, now to today's uh, session. Uh, the plans were, uh, as per the program, to have our fantastic uh, normal session, if I can put it that way, with um, the Treasurers from New South Wales and Victoria. I think uh, understandably but disappointingly, uh, the Treasurer from New South Wales, Dominic Perrottet, has been called away uh, and is no longer able to participate in the, in the discussion. He has uh, sent his uh, sincere apologies, but as I said, uh, completely understandable given the circumstances that they are addressing in New South Wales. Uh, Victorian Treasurer uh, Tim Pallas has graciously agreed to go solo, um, and uh, I think he and I will do our best to channel uh, Dominic's uh, normal energy and enthusiasm for these conversations. Um, after our session this morning, we're going to have a, a timely conversation on sustainable infrastructure and how the pandemic has reshaped planning. Um, I'm not going to go through the rest of the program because uh, you can uh, get that online if you download the State of the Nation conference app, which I would please encourage you to do. It includes the full program, uh, information on speakers, sponsors, um, attendees lists and more. 
Um, of course, can I ask you to join the conversation, uh, Twitter, uh, so, sorry, can I ask you to join us in our conversation on Twitter at CEDA underscore news. We're going to be tweeting throughout the day, hashtag SON 2021. Um, as always, don't miss the opportunity to get your questions in as well. Uh, you can do that through the Pigeonhole app, uh, which is cedar.pigeonhole.at. Um, and there's a poll question uh, as well. So give us your views to the poll question, shoot your questions through so I can put them to the Victorian Treasurer. Uh, we've got our usual uh, live scribing going on as well. KPMG, you collaborate. You'll see that throughout um, our chat this morning uh, and that'll be available online as well. Now it's time for uh, an opportunity to have a chat with um, the Victorian Treasurer, Tim Pallas. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Linda, it's great to be with you. And uh, once again, thanks to CEDA for continuing, continuing uh, your indulgence of uh, uh, the uh, uh, interstate rivalry that uh, uh, sometimes manifests itself on the state of the state's discussion. Um, can I pass on my uh, 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 sincere best wishes to New South Wales as they confront uh, uh, the challenge that we've all had to confront at various times? Uh, uh, I think uh, everybody would be wishing them all the best to get through this as quickly as possible. Uh, it's in the interest of their population. It's in the interest of the nation uh, and uh, any support and assistance that Victoria can provide, uh, we stand ready, willing and able. Well, thanks, Treasurer. I mean, I think uh, absolutely share those um, sentiments and, um, you know, anyone who's had to uh, to deal with it and obviously Victorians have, have had the, the challenges of lockdowns, um, you never wish it on anyone else. So we're hoping that um, that they can uh, manage this as, as best and as quickly as possible. Um, Treasurer, in, in the time... It wasn't that long ago, actually, that you and I were on stage together here in uh, Melbourne talking about the Victorian budget. Uh, between now and then, we, we have had to endure uh, another short lockdown. Um, but I just thought I, we might take the opportunity to start by sort of getting your perspectives in light of um, that 14-day lockdown, but also some recent data just on how the Victorian economy is travelling. And just if I can, in terms of um, you know, recent data, just before we came online, you and I were having a bit of a chat about the unemployment data that came out last week. And that, I mean, the, quite frankly, the spectacular result for Victoria with an unemployment rate below 5%. So how are you seeing things at the moment? Well, I think it's fair to say that we're all a little surprised about the resilience of the national economy. And Victoria seems to be uh, uh, well and truly um, bouncing back very strongly. Um, the most recent uh, um, lockdown, the fourth lockdown um, we've had to endure, um, uh, not out of any desire to, to see it happen, but out of a desire to protect the resurgence and, and the resilience of the Victorian economy and, the, uh, and to protect the wellbeing of the Victorian community, probably cost about $1.3 billion. Um, uh, about $700 million in the first week and about $600 million in the second week out of the, uh, out of the Victorian economy. Um, when you think that we're talking about GSP of around $450 billion, that's about 0.3% of uh, the overall size of the economy. Um, but it is, uh, I think, a clear demonstration of the challenges that we are going to confront um, uh, as a community going forward. And uh, that's why, of course, uh, our best wishes to uh, New South Wales in the current environment, but also a general recognition that the challenges that we confront are going to be around until we get the community uh, substantially uh, uh, inoculated and vaccinated. Uh, but we do have, I think, strong foundations for economic recovery in, in Victoria. Uh, we've had uh, above trend growth for five years, um, nation leading jobs growth. We've got some strong fundamentals um, and Victoria is well and truly on track for a strong recovery despite uh, the recent restrictions. Uh, the economic recovery has been stronger, faster than almost anyone expected and I'd have to include myself in that category. Uh, and it, no more clearly than uh, the numbers that we're seeing out of our labour market. Victoria's added more than 250,000 jobs since September last year. 
almost half of all the jobs growth uh, right across the nation. And unemployment in Victoria um, sits around about 4.8%. Uh, that's 4.3% in regional Victoria on the back of figures released yesterday. So we're forecasting economic uh, growth uh, by, by about 6.5% in 2122, about one and a half times the forecast for the national average growth. So I think there is uh, great opportunity uh, and uh, certainly a fair degree of enthusiasm uh, in Victoria about uh, the, what the future holds for us. Treasurer, just on the, the strength of the economy, um, I mean, obviously in the past, Victoria has been a, um, has seen quite significant population growth um, that's underpinned the labour force as well as uh, overall economic strength. One of the things we're starting to hear pretty consistently from uh, CETA members and business more broadly is that they're already facing quite significant challenges in attracting the workforce that they need. Is that something that you're hearing here in Victoria already as well? And are you starting to hear sort of signs or comments about wages pressure or see uh, signs of wages pressure emerging? Uh, well, we're not seeing a lot of signs around wages pressure at the moment, I've got to say, and I suspect that's um, uh, the, the general expectation is you'd have to see a pretty prolonged level of, um, unemployment, uh, of low unemployment uh, together with, um, uh, uh, I think, strategic skill shortages uh, that go on for some time before you'd see that played out more generally in terms of wage returns across the economy. Uh, there is no doubt that there are skill shortages in some key areas, and there have been for quite some time. Uh, we know um, that our building industry has been suffering for quite some time in terms of skill shortages. Um, and, of course, with the lack of uh, overseas uh, um, travel and um, people holding uh, work visas, um, we're seeing that shortage also played out in uh, our agricultural uh, and our, uh, our hospitality and uh, restaurant sectors as well. Um, by and large, I think the, the challenge is going to be to recognise, yes, our population growth is going to be flat uh, uh, or modest at best over the next couple of years. But it does present us with an opportunity too, uh, and that is if you think that the three things that drive uh, an economy and its growth uh, really uh, are, are population growth, productivity growth and participation in the labour market, um, we need to concentrate on the other two elements. Um, obviously, we'd like to see our population grow well and truly uh, above the flat line that the, the latest data has shown for um, Victoria. But to, to achieve that, um, uh, it will take time and it will require our international borders to open. And certainly we're not advocating that our borders open until such time as we have the security and certainty acknowledged that the vaccination rollout has uh, achieved its objective to get as many Australians vaccinated and safe as a consequence of um, our collective efforts, both uh, federal and state. Um, so we'll concentrate uh, upon participation in the labour market, and we're already seeing a very substantial increase in labour market participation. Uh, but we also will need to recognise that there are going to have to be some uh, strategic interventions about how we get our economy to function better. What are the interventions and activities that government can make uh, in order to get greater performance out of the economy, uh, go further uh, effectively uh, with uh, an expectation that population is not going to be one of those central pillars, population growth, for at least a couple of years. And the final point I'd make is there is an opportunity here as well. And that opportunity is um, for uh, a long time in Victoria, we've been playing catch up on infrastructure. Um, uh, the embedded demand around infrastructure, um, uh, whether it be economic or social infrastructure, has meant that governments have had to... Uh, move at uh, a cracking speed. Now, we could take the opportunity of a, a, a lower population growth as a, an opportunity not to do uh, anything or anything more, or, or alternatively see it as an opportunity to deal with some of that backlog 
get on and deliver the infrastructure that can provide for the needs of a growing community. And we know in time, once we get through the pandemic event, uh, and also provide for the economic opportunities for the future. So that uh, constitutes the central objectives of the government. Uh, don't waste uh, what is an unfortunate uh, event, but nonetheless an opportunity, provided we're prepared to seize it. Thanks, Treasurer. I mean, I think the comments you make are really resonating in terms of the conversations we've been having in the last day at State of the Nation as well, and clearly... You know, the Treasurer spoke on our stage at the dinner on Wednesday night. You know, he spoke about the upcoming intergenerational report, which I'll, I'll come back to later. Um, but obviously population isn't going to be, um, you know, where we thought it would be uh, two years ago, and that's going to be a permanent uh, hit to the size of our country. Um, and so very much the focus on productivity and participation. It was interesting uh, when I saw the unemployment rate as an economist, the first thing I did was go and have a look at whether the participation rate had, had actually delivered that result. But no, in fact, participation rate is, is up here, which is great. But the, the big question is really uh, is around that productivity piece of the puzzle um, and transformative um, policies that are going to support that. In, in your budget, your recent budget, which... Um, Josh Frydenberg said we even even budget six weeks ago we're allowed to keep talking about so we can't forget about them, but in the Victorian budget, um, obviously you know some continued investments in infrastructure which you've spoken to, a big big package around mental health which I think resonated with people. It's obviously uh, a really important issue highlighted even more by the challenges of the last eighteen months, but all of these things come uh, with a price tag. Uh, I know Treasurer in the media here in Victoria, a fair bit of uh, commentary around uh, tax increases that were included in the budget. And not surprisingly, first cab off the rank in our questions um, is actually directly on that. Uh, and a question around the choices you made around which taxes to increase and, and you know, what was the logic of increasing those taxes to fund mental health? Well, uh, of course, the uh, I just noticed that uh, President Biden has given a speech and he, he made the comment that we need physical inf infrastructure, we need human infrastructure, and we need a fairer tax system uh, to pay for all of it. Uh, and, of course, uh, the US government um, uh, has recently made the point that we need to grow our economy from the bottom and the middle out. Uh, so the days of trickle-down economics, uh, certainly so far as this government is concerned, uh, are, uh, are behind us. I think it was J.K. Galbraith that said the concept of trickle-down economics is if you feed a horse enough oats, uh, there'll be enough passed through to feed the birds at the other end. Uh, and it's it's a false assumption. Uh, it needs to... We need, therefore, to recognise what's happened as a consequence of this economic event. Um, uh, who is doing relatively well out of this event. And believe me, uh, we've seen some pretty substantial wealth appreciation occur. Uh, low interest rates almost certainly mean uh, that asset prices and values increase. Um, and who's not doing so well? We, we know who they are. Uh, they tend to be people in insecure forms of employment uh, and uh, women, young people, uh, tend also to make up a disproportionately high level of those who've been adversely affected during this event. So from a government point of view, we, we, uh, it's not about essentially trying to uh, under, undermine uh, people's right to run businesses and to make a profit, but it's about recognising that we do have to uh, put in place measures for fiscal repair. I think it'd be fair to say I'm the only government so far that's demonstrated any interest in fiscal repair through our budgetary settings. Uh, um, and maybe that's essentially a demonstration that uh, the quicker that we can revert our economic settings to normalcy, the greater opportunity business has uh, to get back to those uh, settings. Um, we can't wish away the challenges that continue to confront us but what we can do, I think, is to recognise that uh, the, the way that we've got through this is essentially by being together uh, and acting in concert to achieve a common purpose. Uh, that also means that those uh, who've uh, done well out of this event 
need to continue to make their contribution to help everybody get through this. So uh, if I take you through the, the sort of changes uh, that we've made, uh, uh, we've announced what I think are fair and progressive uh, tax changes. Uh, the vast majority of Victorians, for example, won't be impacted by these taxes. Uh, indeed, uh, the introduction of a premium stamp duty rate, for example, uh, will only impact properties valued above $2 million, uh, and that's less than 4% of dutiable transactions each year in Victoria. The land tax changes are also targeted. First and foremost, land tax doesn't apply uh, to the family home or to primary production land. Less than 6% of Victorians pay uh, land tax in the first place and less than 8% of all land tax payers will be impacted by these changes. Uh, uh, also, for, uh, 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 for $2 million of dutiable land, the impact will be about uh, $500 per year. And um, if, uh, if you think about the changes that we've also made with regard to payroll tax, the increased impost for those uh, uh, national companies with a salary of $10 million and then a further impost on $100 million, you'll still see that the uh, long-term payroll tax rate for the state of Victoria is competitive as against New South Wales payroll tax up until when, when they go back to their normal rate of 5.45% from the 1st of July next year, uh, up to about $135 million worth of payroll. So um, we're still competitive, um, uh, well and truly competitive by comparison to uh, our northern neighbour, but we're also making the investment that I think will drive productivity going forward. Our, our mental health and wellbeing levy, for example, uh, is aimed at uh, dealing with what has been uh, one of the greatest uh, challenges of our time, and that is the mental health problems that confront uh, Victorians. Uh, we would have liked, of course, to have partnered with the Commonwealth around a national tax approach to uh, how you resource mental health. Uh, as it transpired, uh, uh, they didn't have an interest in that. So we've had to move uh, on our own. That being the case, uh, what we do know is that from the Royal Commission into mental health, that uh, mental health causes costs about $13 billion to our economy. And uh, even to business in terms of uh, lost uh, attendance and workplace injury, it comes at about the cost of uh, $1.9 billion a year to business. So this is a modest investment, I think, in the wellbeing of the community. And also, I think it's a smart investment uh, for business in the long term. So, Treasurer, we've had a follow-up question um around the impact of payroll tax changes on employment and, and whether uh, you're concerned that it will be, a, um, you know, a, a barrier to higher levels of employment for some employers. Well, I suppose the vast majority of uh, employing businesses in Victoria uh, won't pay the mental health and wellbeing levy. That's the first point to make. Uh, uh, most Victorian employers will continue to have one of the... Uh, uh, lowest top payroll tax rates in the nation. Uh, Victoria's regional, uh, regional employers will continue to have the lowest payroll tax in the nation with daylight second, uh, with uh, a rate of 1.2125%, uh, uh, by far the lowest in the nation. So um, certainly if payroll tax is a measure by which jobs uh, are, uh, are uh, assessed, I think we've probably got a, uh, a pretty fair claim to saying uh, our payroll tax rates are competitive with New South Wales, certainly, um, uh, and they certainly will provide, I think, opportunity for jobs to continue to grow in Victoria, particularly in regional Victoria, uh, where we now have the lowest uh, regional unemployment rate in the nation. So, Treasurer, I think, um, you know, let me join the dots a little bit here on the conversation we've been having so far. Um, one, there's no doubt that there are going to be increased demands on government spending in the future. Um, ageing population, 
changing expectations. You've spoken about the need for some infrastructure catch up here in Victoria. As I said earlier, th that all has to be uh, paid for. But also, you know, as we look to push productivity as far as we can uh, and to really lift what has been a declining productivity performance around the country, the idea of the best possible tax system and structures is obviously going to have to go back on the agenda, uh, a conversation around the most effective taxes and the most efficient taxes. Um, it's an issue that you and uh, Dominique Perrottet quite often sort of uh, talk about in these forums. I know New South Wales has, has been probably out the front a bit more talking about the more substantive structural reform, if, if you like. Um, what do you think is the likely future agenda around tax? Is it, is it something that is now going to find its way back onto the agenda? It will, of course, involve the states and the federal government. Is it something you, you are going to be pushing? And uh, what do you think we're likely to see in the next 12 to 24 months? Well, I think um, uh, the, one, the one thing that I really enjoy about the Board of Treasurers, uh, that is where the states sit around and try and strategize about what we can do uh, in terms of running our budgets and our economies better, is that there's a genuine belief um, that um, uh, we need to uh, look at how we can work more cooperatively together. Um, I don't mind a bit of competitive federalism. I don't mind the idea of one state trying to outdo uh, others. Um, yeah, Dominic, uh, I think, uh, in fairness, it, it, as is his inimitable style, um, uh, talks uh, a, a lot more about reform. I tend to be more focused on results uh, than the uh, ongoing discussion. Perhaps it's because uh, as I've got older, I've become increasingly cynical about uh, never-ending debates. Um, it's much better to uh, deliver. And, of course, I wasn't out there talking long and loud about the need for a replacement for fuel excise uh, and uh, the need to put in place a long-term and sustainable revenue stream for the states to effectively manage road user charging. And that's exactly what the uh, electric uh, uh, vehicle user charge uh, aims to do. Um, given that we're talking only about 0.1% of all vehicles on our road at the moment, uh, we've ma married a desire to get more vehicles on the road, more electric and low emissions vehicles on the road, with a modest charge, about half of what they would pay in terms of uh, tax payments to the Commonwealth for fuel excise. And the money will go to the governments that actually have to provide for the maintenance and management of the road networks, the, the states. Um, so from our perspective, we've got a proud record of tax reform that's made our system fairer, more progressive, more sustainable, and we're continuing that record with our latest budget. We cut payroll taxes for businesses in six successive budgets. Uh, in a, an Australian first, we cut payroll tax for regional Victoria down to half the metropolitan rate, and we're cutting it further down to 25% of the metropolitan rate a year earlier than we planned or promised. So uh, we've been looking at uh, uh, the analysis confirming that uh, this, this work is uh, effectively creating jobs, and there's no doubt about it. Properly positioned uh, tax reform creates jobs and grows the economy. Uh, but we can't walk away from the fact that states need sustainable um, uh, revenue bases so that they can deliver services. Uh, I like to uh, describe our, our federation a bit like this, that the, the Commonwealth are the, are the nouns and the states are the verbs. Uh, we're the doing words and they're the titles. Um, and um, I, I don't mind that they like to pretend that they're you know, driving the bus most of the time when clearly they're not. Uh, after all, I'm told they don't hold a hose. But the, the practical consequence is that um, uh, most Australians expect states to do the heavy lifting when crisis uh, confronts us. Uh, and uh, before the pandemic, the, uh, we've seen that regional unemployment rate in Victoria reached a low of 3.9%. So while it's at 4.3% now, it's still well below uh, the national average. And it's a clear demonstration that we've been able to move forward. And the other point, the other reform that I'm pretty uh, pleased about is in an Australian first in our November budget, we introduced new jobs tax credits. 
uh, more than $800 million in tax relief for small and medium businesses that increase their payrolls. So this incentive means that, that more businesses will be able to rehire staff and employ new workers, uh, the less, uh, and there'll be less payroll tax that they'll have to pay as a consequence of the, that employment. So that relief is going to continue next year, and we ex estimate that it will uh, support something like 9,400 jobs. Once again, another illustration of uh, a strategic intervention was our landmark Homes for Victorians package. We eliminated stamp duty on first homes up to $600,000 with concessions on homes up to $750,000. So since July 2017, these changes have helped more than 143,000 Victorians crack into the housing market and saved them in excess of $2.4 billion. So uh, consistent with that record, the government's striking a balance between those wanting to buy their home, uh, large property investors who benefited from soaring property uh, values. Uh, we're introducing a new windfall gains tax on profits from rezoned land. That'll ensure that large gains from rezoning are shared with the community and invested in public transport, schools and other vital infrastructure. Um, and it's also a massive integrity boost. It's about making sure that when the stroke of a pen creates enormous wealth opportunities, uh, that it's done properly for all the right reasons and it's shared by those who will be the beneficiaries of the communities that are being built. So uh, for new residential properties in the Melbourne local government area, we've also provided tax relief by um, make, removing uh, uh, stamp duty for, 12, for those properties that haven't been sold in 12 months and uh, if it's over 12 months, we've removed it all together in the CBD and Melbourne local government area. That's about recognising governments have to be fleet of foot. We have to acknowledge the circumstances that's confronting various sections in the community, make interventions and use our tax system uh, to have a fairer, more progressive system, but also to recognise a business uh, on occasion need a hand and government's interventions should be uh, focused in a laser sharp way towards their interests as well. Treasurer, there was a lot in that and there's a few other threads I'm going to, I'm going to pick up later, but uh, you went to electric vehicles. It was one of the questions that's jumped into uh, my poll, uh, into my um, app. Um, obviously following the budget, that was a, a focal point for some of the media commentary as well. Um, as you push for reductions in emissions, aren't you sending uh, mixed messages or the wrong message around um, the road user charges for electric vehicles? If I'd had uh, the New South Wales Treasurer here would have given me an opportunity to talk about their changes, which were reductions in stamp duties, which are seen as being more supportive of the rollout of electric vehicles. Um, what's your view on this? On the take that what you've done here is actually a disincentive and, and, and perhaps inconsistent with a desire to encourage the take up of electric vehicles and uh, the broader aspirations around reducing emissions here in Victoria? Well, I suppose um, I'd say that uh, New South Wales and Victoria are approaching uh, the same issue from slightly different perspectives, but I don't think there's much doubt that the end result is a road user charge uh, being introduced for zero and low emissions vehicles. Um, our uh, government has put up about $100 million worth of investment to ensure a fairer and smoother transition to zero emissions vehicles in the state of Victoria. Um, if you think about it, the revenue that we expect to gain out of zero and low emissions vehicles is around about $30 million over the uh, next th three years. So uh, essentially for every uh, uh, dollar of revenue we get, we're putting in at least three uh, into uh, making sure that we facilitate the uptake of zero and uh, low emissions vehicles. Um, but the other thing that I think is uh, vitally important is that uh, we know that um, uh, we have a, a challenge in front of us to encourage the uptake of zero and, and low emissions vehicles, and we're going to continue that effort. So on top of uh, our plans to uh, move to 50% uh, uh, take up of zero and low emissions vehicles uh, in, uh, by 2030, we're also uh, moving 
uh, towards uh, a, an advisory panel that's going to tell us what are the right interventions to make to continue this effort. We were the first uh, state to put in place uh, a substantive grant payment scheme for people purchasing uh, zero and low emissions vehicles. The really interesting thing about that is that we've seen a massive uptake in the importation of zero and low emissions vehicles since the government announced its charge. Um, now, I don't know whether it's cause and effect, but I'll make the point that uh, you could hardly argue that that has therefore disincentivised uh, the uptake of zero and electric vehicles. What we've also seen is with the um, uh, introduction of the charge, already uh, claims for grants ha have essentially uh, reached uh, something like uh, three times the last year's uh, expenditure on uh, or purchasing of zero and low emission vehicles. So we've got uh, effectively three times worth of grant applications for the number of zero and electric vehicles we'd expect in any given year. So there's clearly um, these incentives are working. I'm not about throwing money at a problem that doesn't get a tangible result. That's a waste of taxpayers' money. But what I think I can demonstrate is that the government has a resolve that is working. Um, uh, we've got more than 600 registrations of interest for the zero uh, and low emission subsidy in a month, uh, uh, and that's more than half the number of electric vehicles sold in Victoria in 2020 already uh, applications coming in for grants. We're also seeing, uh, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, in the last six months, uh, the rate of new passenger electric vehicle imports into Victoria has tripled. So you can see that there's something quite profound happening here. And uh, yes, I think New South Wales could well argue that some of their incentives are uh, more generous than Victoria. I would argue that in the interest of the taxpayer, I've got to get a result. I've got to get more people into zero and low emission vehicles. Uh, and I think I can demonstrate that all of the uh, early data is indicating that our policies are working and working quite dramatically. There may be more that we have to do. Uh, and as a government, we remain committed to do it. That's why we've established a, uh, an advisory committee on the uptake of zero and low emissions vehicles. Uh, and it will report to us in time for us to consider what more we need to do uh, uh, come budget time next year. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for that very comprehensive response. And I think uh, <laughs> we'll, you can, we'll, we'll see whether your correlation proves correct in the long term, uh, but fing fingers crossed. Um, look, we spoke about the low um, unemployment rate in the regions already, but sitting alongside of that, I think, when we reflect on the impact of um, the pandemic has been a, a lot of talk about new ways of working, a lot of talk about um, people, some permanent changes, if you like, around where and how people work. Uh, that may see an increase in uh, employment in the regions and more people working in the regions and not moving, uh, you know, travelling into the cities. How uh, are you thinking about that in the context of infrastructure spending? Is it something that you've sort of turned your mind to? Do you, is there a, a sense that the way that Melbourne works as a city is is going to change fundamentally from here on in and, and does need to be reflected in, in infrastructure planning? I think we're, there will be many lessons learned out of the pandemic. And I, uh, I suppose all of us probably have been uh, shocked at our capacity to adapt to the challenges that confront us. Um, if you'd have asked me whether it was possible to have the sort of level of economic activity uh, happening remotely uh, in our economy, um, uh, even 12 months ago, I would have, uh, well, perhaps 18 months ago, I would have been shocked uh, to, to realise that uh, much of the things that we thought had to be done physically um, uh, can be done remotely. Many of our businesses have demonstrated how uh, efficient they are at adapting at the challenges to living in a, in a virtual and online environment. Um, yes, it will mean that some of these changes are going to last uh, um, will be lasting and will require us to reconsider things like uh, uh, where infrastructure investment is best placed, what the nature 
of our, our cities and our communities will look like going forward. And certainly uh, uh, there's been a, a demonstrable interest in regional living as a consequence of this event, particularly here in Victoria. So um, a number of things I think will flow from this. Um, better connectivity uh, will be a key requirement of an efficient economy going forward. And that's why uh, this government has invested uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in eliminating uh, all black spots in our regional areas uh, and also working with NBN to get much more efficient broadband delivery uh, into our outer suburbs and, and into our regions. Um, also, uh, as a government, we are looking to uh, identify and to build uh, facilities that will uh, allow for shared employment opportunities in the outer suburbs, rather than necessarily have people uh, move all the way into the city. And we're going to have to reconsider how we make uh, our inner city environment uh, a much more desirable point of destination. Um, obviously, in the short term, with a lack of international tourism and international students, uh, a lot of our businesses in the inner city are suffering. So uh, how do we uh, assist them in making them a point of tourism uh, um, destination? Um, how do we facilitate uh, people from the outer suburbs seeing inner city Melbourne as a place that they journey to regularly uh, to uh, uh, get uh, hot uh, access to restaurants and uh, the, the sort of destination tourism that we've expected from interstate and international uh, visitors. Now, I'm not pretending for one moment that this will offset the damage that's been done through the closure of our international borders and the restrictions on interstate movement and the lack of international tourists uh, and students. But what I do say is that uh, we have to look at new and innovative ways to facilitate uh, the maintenance and management of uh, a part of the cultural and, um, and sporting offering that the state of Victoria has become uh, known for. So we do have to walk that extra yard with our uh, restaurant sector, with our entertainment and hospitality sector to ensure that they can see their way through what will be a very difficult time over the next 12 and 18 months. Treasurer, one of the themes that sort of emerged a little bit through our um, conference is, and, and we saw it really over the last 18 months, um, different levels of, of government working collaboratively, uh, business working with government to address issues around supply chain and the like. There's a question that's come through around the payroll tax levy to support mental health. Um, and the question is really around, if you're leaning on, on larger businesses to fund these initiatives, is there an appetite uh, to involve them in co-design um, of, of those uh, responses? And, you know, I think I can, I can draw an extra sort of link to that in saying, obviously, the implications of mental health play out in the workforce, so business definitely needs to be part of that conversation. But, but I guess more broadly, there is a question here around, you know, to what extent do you, do you foresee working uh, with business in the future to co-design responses uh, and it's, it is something that's being talked about a lot more in the context of looking for uh, new solutions to uh, big challenges for the future and wicked problems that we have with us now. What's the thinking there? And, um, you know, the, are there things that you've learned from the, the past 18 months that you would really like to, to take forward in terms of how, you, how the government's worked with business? Absolutely. Uh, just on the mental health issue, um, obviously we've had a, a Royal Commission into mental health that's, uh, given us a, a blueprint of the interventions that they expect um, the uh, government to make. And uh, that Royal Commission did take uh, uh, a very substantial number of submissions from business, uh, from community groups, uh, from people who've suffered the effects of mental health. And uh, I think the simple observation to make here is that uh, uh, our mental health system was broken uh, and it needs to be rebuilt from the ground up and it needs to be the subject of very substantial investment. Uh, um, what we have um, de definitely will be doing is working very closely with business uh, uh, around the design and development 
and the implementation of each and every one of the recommendations of the Royal Commission. Uh, we can't do it alone and we believe that there's plenty of expertise in the private sector to help us implement uh, those recommendations. And there's a lot of gaps that need to be filled in, uh, a lot of uh, practical understanding and learnings that the, the business sector and community groups can give us uh, around this area. Um, one caveat I would put around that, co-design can't be used as code for uh, the exclusion of uh, business responsibilities. I've heard from a number of groups recently that, look, we already put in place good mental health facilities uh, and as a consequence, we should be exempted from the application of these charges. Well, this is a community and societal challenge and it's one that everybody with the capacity uh, will need to make a contribution to. And if you've already done the right thing by your employees, well, that's a great thing. Uh, but it isn't a, 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 an excuse to exculpate further action and action that has widespread application across the community. What we are seeing is that the manifestation of mental health problems are, are happening earlier uh, and indeed uh, many of the responses will have to resource public sector provision of interventions in our school network. Uh, well, we'll need the resourcing to do that and every business every Victorian will be the beneficiary of those sort of interventions. No, I think that's a, a point well made and I don't think anyone's disputing the need for, you know, really serious focus on this. Um, I, I'm sure like everyone else, you know, we've seen the challenges here at CEDA of the, the last um, 18 months um, for our workforces. Anyone who's got children understands as well. Um, that, you know, many of them are, are struggling with, um, you know, the, the last 18 months and, and broader issues. And so those investments, particularly in, in pre prevention, are just are so, so critical. Treasurer, I'm mindful of time. I'm hoping that you can tolerate um, two more questions, if that's all right. Um, uh, we talked as before we came online um, around the fact that, um, because I do like to sort of draw some comparisons with New South Wales, but... Um, the New South Wales Treasurer not too long ago uh, launching the New South Wales Intergenerational Report. Uh, a bit of a plug for us. Next Monday we've got um, Federal Treasurer Josh Frydenberg uh, launching the Federal Government's Intergenerational Report. Um, documents that are intended to sort of structure the forward kind of reform agenda or at least promote serious conversation about what's needed to address longer-term challenges. Um, is this something that's on the radar here in Victoria? Is something you've got an appetite to, to do, Treasurer, to roll out a Victorian intergenerational report anytime soon? Not really, I've got to say, Melinda. Um, uh, if you, uh, you could paper the walls of Treasury with uh, the pages of intergenerational reports um, and the, the, the broad findings tend to be the same. You need a more efficient tax base. Uh, you need to recognise that um, uh, investments that you make early have a profound beneficial effect upon the community uh, uh, into the future and that we are seeing a distortion of uh, wealth and wellbeing uh, as between generations um, and we have to find ways to address that. Um, so as a government, we prefer to look at those learnings uh, and apply them without necessarily prognosticating about them just one more time. Um, uh, I'm not sure that there's much to the weight of human understanding that could be added by another one of these reports. So um, what we are doing is getting on with um, that sort of intergenerational economic investment. Um, we've got over $130 billion of infrastructure underway, uh, commencing or continuing in the state of Victoria uh, in this year's uh, budget. Uh, we've got uh, uh, an early intervention investment framework where we will uh, change what constitutes a, a distortion of uh, budgeted interventions by moving away from acute presentation of the problems uh, to preventative approach to problems and finding a way to effectively account for that. Um, so timely and effective help. Uh, what I think is a particularly um, valuable reform, whether it's tackling rough sleeping, uh, um, which um, uh, uh, will assist us or moving young people uh, as quickly as possible out 
of uh, the uh, the legal system and back as into being productive members of our community. So uh, on the skills front, uh, we've heard a lot of talk about skills, but the state of Victoria is actually out there rebuilding our TAFE system, providing fee- free TAFE, uh, 60,000 extra free TAFE places. Um, uh, we've invested over 85 million in a new uh, skills authority. Um, we're committed basically to ensuring that um, uh, we identify those areas of industry that we should be growing for productive value. So a $2 billion breakthrough fund aimed at creating a pipeline of some almost 16,000 jobs, but looking at innovation and entrepreneurship as a key part of government's facilitation and investment. So uh, we see that the best way to look after the distortions of choices that governments make in the here and now is to recognise that those distortions exist and putting in place the policies today that will help the future have the prosperity that they need. And believe me, coming out of this event, uh, what what has been a very substantial debt event for the nation uh, and for the state of Victoria, um, we need to recognise that now is the time to build the tools and the capacity for economic uh, enrichment for the future. Well, Treasurer, I think it is fair to say um, anyone who's been following your your responses to our discussion uh, today would have heard the word outcomes quite a few times, and it was something that uh, Treasurer Perite called out, actually, in uh, in his intergenerational report, that um, outcome outcome budgeting is, is front and centre, and really, at the end of the day, uh, that's what matters most. Now, the final question, uh, uh, not necessarily on the topic of reform, but um, Premier returning to work soon. And uh, I'm wondering, I think, I think you said back to work on Monday. Uh, what's, on the, uh, what's on the menu for morning tea? I don't know, but I'm, I've got to tell you, Melinda, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, the Premier is, I don't think he's ever had this sort of break in his working life, and I suspect <laughs> he's been... Um, uh, uh, formulating uh, new and exciting interventions that uh, the, he'll charge his ministers with responsibility uh, to go out and to uh, uh, give effect to. Uh, we've all missed him. He's been uh, a vital part of the government uh, and his vision and drive, I think, have been uh, have put us in the position that we're in. I've got to say it's been a real pleasure working with the acting Premier uh, uh, while the Premier's been away, but... Um, uh, in the acting premier's uh, own uh, acknowledgement, it would be great to have Dan back. Um, we've uh, he is a vital part, uh, the vital part, uh, I think, in many ways of the government uh, and his drive, uh, his vision, and his uh, determination to make the state a better place. I think uh, will uh, now propel us to uh, bigger and better things. Uh, but I got to confide, I am a little nervous about how much uh, uh, thinking he's been doing while he's been recuperating. Well, Treasurer, I think uh, all of us, are, I, I probably share a bit of that concern for you. I mean, if he if he dons the uh, Kathmandu jacket to come into Cabinet and to uh, take that approach to, to the reform agenda from here, um, we'll just have to watch and wait and see what happens from, from there. Um, thank you so much for your time and uh, and for sort of carrying the load through this session. I think you're going to have to let uh, Dominique Perrottet know that he owes you one um, and we'll make sure that we we get him on stage so uh, he, he can pay, pay you back <laughs> in I'm the near future. I'm looking forward to it. He, he, um, he probably deserves equal time. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure he, I'm sure he thinks so. Um, let me just give you a quick update on the poll question that we asked. Um, if you had to pick one priority for state governments in Australia to focus on, um, what would it be? Uh, top of the poll here at 33% was enabling en- energy transition to reduce emissions. Uh, equal second was lowering taxes and improving infrastructure. <laughs> Always the <laughs> two sides of, of, of the same coin, perhaps. Um, and third was improving access to affordability of housing. Interestingly, um, improving access to and quality of healthcare services uh, didn't get a vote at all. So um, perhaps that's a little bit of a vote of confidence that we've managed the health crisis well and we can now... Uh, divert some attention to other areas in our economy. But interesting results there. 
Um, Treasurer, thank you again for your time. All the best. Uh, pass on our best regards to the Premier and um, uh, more power to his arm if he's come back with new and exciting ideas for not only the Victorian economy, but, but how uh, the state government might work with the federal government to really push forward uh, some reforms for our um, economic and social future. Thank you again. To the audience, we're going to have a slightly longer break. We'll be back at 10 past 11 uh, for um, a really good conversation on sustainable infrastructure, which will be uh, chaired by CEDA's Chief Economist, Jared Ball. Until then, go and grab a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and uh, we'll see you back shortly. Thanks for your time. <laughs>